The main clients of the IMF and the World Bank are the, are the multinational corporations. It's for their benefit that these things are done. These countries have to cut back sharply on, on their expenditures to be more appealing to foreign investment. World Bank and IMF policies of conditionality really caused a lot of harm and they demanded instant release of price controls. They de deregulated the exchange rate and then prices just went fly high and then they said oh no we can't increase wages because that causes inflation and in the meantime people's earnings had collapsed by 90 percent. Always one of those is raising interest rates often to ridiculously high levels 20 percent and plus which has the effect of stifling domestic investment because who can borrow money to invest and create economic development at that rate within the country, very few, while assuring a high return on foreign investment. If Suharto uh, in Indonesia, you know, maybe the most corrupt dictator in the modern period, has uh, billions of dollars of debt, you don't take the billions of dollars that, from him and his family who robbed it. What you do is impose structural adjustment programs, conditionalities, on poor Indonesians, which destroy their lives uh, so that the debts can be paid off to the rich investors. The money that goes into the privatization fund actually is intended to pay back the people who are the creditors and who are very often uh, involved in acquiring the, the assets which are being put on the auction block. Clearly those policies that require overnight privatization, for example, they create hardship in the countries where they are practiced um, and it, it gives the impression of taking advantage of a desperate person. These economic policies are repeated worldwide. Many immigrants to the U.S. are indeed desperate. Often they are seen as scapegoats for the effects of economic globalization on a faltering U.S. economy. They take jobs unfilled by Americans that would otherwise be outsourced. The real problem presented by illegal immigration is security, not the supposed threat to the economy. The militarization of the border was initiated by Clinton in 1994, Operation Gatekeeper. Something else happened in 1994. NAFTA was implemented. And they could perceive that the effect of NAFTA is going to be to undermine Mexican agriculture which cannot compete with highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness, uh, undermine small Mexican businesses, which aren't going to be able to compete with U.S. corporations that get national treatment in Mexico. So sooner or later, there'll be a flood of people north. We better militarize the border. There's no doubt that, that security on the Mexican-American border is, is a joke. The wall is not really going to make the difference of anything. Even to save your country, even to stop our people, this is not the way to work. There are other ways to keep your country safe. And again, this to think that we are human, that we are people. Yes, and we have families, we have life, we have dreams. We just want to be and work together. When you're talking about the United States' relationship with Mexico and Latin America and the Caribbean. From a trade perspective, you're talking about two main pacts. We're talking about um, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and SAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, which includes all of the countries that are involved in the Caribbean Basin Initiative and several other Central American governments. NAFTA is no equal. Even if you are working in a good factory, then the payment is a little higher than the sum of the Mexicans, but it's not the real pay that we need. It's, that's why we need to work more about that, to be more equal, to, the, to have the same opportunities there and here. The SAFTA is not so good because United States corporations and the United States commercialization will we'll take advantage of low-wage workers in these areas. The U.S. executive director of the uh, IMF once described the IMF as the credit community's enforcer. Okay. Now, the IMF is, which is basically a branch of the, close to a branch of the Treasury Department, is dedicated, like a good deal of policy, to undermine the threat of capitalism and of democracy. It used to be that countries were considered superpowers. Now what we see is that 
It's corporations, transnational corporations. If we look who is behind, let's say, uh, U.S. Uh, public policy, it's Wall Street. I have a theory. I always said there are no more superpowers but supermarket in the world. The one that controls the market controls. Regime changes, transnational corporations, and 9-11, how are these connected? The IMF and the World Bank started to perform a new role, which was that of, uh, of uh, uh, exerting um, control over uh, these highly indebted countries and essentially establishing uh, an alternative parallel government to, uh, to the national government of these countries. Behind the ostensible government sits enthroned an invisible government owing no allegiance and acknowledging no responsibility to the people. The problem is globalization has, has gone so fast that we lack the structures to provide adequate regulation around it. The elite of the elite would be uh, running the world in effect. Investment bankers are my um, uh, invisible government. The, the real power is behind the throne. That combines those two things. You know, what, what makes the world go around? It ain't love, it's money and power. When a government is dependent on bankers for money, they and not the leaders of the government control the situation. Money has no motherland. Financiers are without patriotism and without decency. Their sole object is gain. I think the end is the execution of American financial power wherever it decides to take it and exercise that power in the world. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause. When we are successful, a new world order. We have a real chance at this new world order. We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. There was something called the Project for a New American Century that actually was a position paper by some neoconservatives in government outlining what they would like to see as kind of the future role of the United States, uh, which was basically to dominate the rest of the world economically, militarily, culturally. But they needed to have some change take place before that was possible and that that change might only be possible if it were precipitated by some catastrophe such as Pearl Harbor. Considering these people were major players in government at the time, uh, one can certainly see where 9-11 would work to their advantage. Are you happy with the official story about 9-11? The vast majority of Americans, unfortunately, buy the mainstream media version, which always turns out later to have been a crock of lies, usually fed by government officials. I'm standing outside D.H. Griffin Wrecking Company, based in Greensboro, North Carolina, which was chosen by the DDC as the consultant in charge of all demolition operations at the World Trade Center site following the 9-11 disaster. The company response team oversaw and approved all demolition activities associated with the cleanup project. Weeks Marine Incorporated, the Cranford, New Jersey Corporation, was the firm responsible for offloading by barge from Manhattan more than 1.2 million tons of structural steel and other debris. No one from FEMA would talk with me, so I tried for over a year to interview David Griffin, Jr. to find out if he could shed light on rumors of detonation caps being found in the debris or if he knew why the steel was removed before a thorough forensic analysis took place. All attempts to schedule an interview were rejected with no explanation. It's all fakery. They, they've, uh, Arab hijackers didn't do all this. It was an inside job. It was our own elements of our own government. According to recent polls, about a third of the population believes that the Bush administration was responsible for 9-11. Either they directly arranged it or they made sure it would happen. But what's particularly striking is that, and tell you something about American democracy, is that this huge number of people thinks that the government is run by mass murderers who are mur purposely murdering Americans and doesn't think they can do anything about it. That goes along with the PNAC Project for New American Century. It would take some sort of major disaster to cause the fear among people who would then in turn um, give the government liberties that they wouldn't otherwise give them, give up their own liberties that they wouldn't otherwise give up, and allow the government to take actions that they wouldn't otherwise um, agree with the government taking in order to uh, put that plan in motion. The 9-11 attack on U.S. soil created fear, frustration, resentment, 
and retaliatory strategies.